Today we turn to the third chapter of John. I invite you to turn and follow along as we read and consider verses 1 through 10. Travis, well done. I think you did great, don't you? <laughs> how, how much time did you have to get ready for that? Got a message last night. Well, well done. Well done. Uh, we've been uh, studying the first few chapters of John. Today we come to chapter 3, if today's your first time with us. And these uh, 10 verses here I think are very critical to a, a proper understanding of the gospel, uh, to a proper understanding of human nature, and to a proper understanding of the, the glory of sovereign mercy. So properly understood, uh, these, these verses will bear good fruit in our lives. The fruit of humility, of uh, thankfulness, and worship. We'll bring the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and joy into the house of the Lord. And if they're not properly understood, it will bear not so good fruit like spiritual pride and even arrogance. Nicodemus was a man who thought he had it all figured out. And uh, I suspect everybody else thought he had it all figured out too. But uh, Jesus sh soon showed him otherwise. Let's pray. Father, soon we will reach the shining river. And our pilgrimage here will, uh, will cease sooner than we think. And so prepare us uh, for of that time in our lives, uh, use this passage to that end, uh, that we may worship you fervently and serve you faithfully and, and be humble before you, knowing who we are and all that you have done for us. Thank you for that quickening ray that you diffused in the hearts of your people. And uh, complete the good work you started. We pray that we may indeed be consumed with zeal for the house of the Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. John 3, verses 1 through 10. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. I don't know if they still do this or not, but when I was in high school just a few years ago, uh, we had annual elections for uh, class superlatives. best dressed, most likely to succeed, most athletic. Uh, I can't remember all of them, but quite a, quite a number of them. We had uh, about 430 students in my graduating class, so I never won any of those things. Uh, probably because I didn't deserve to win any of those things. I wasn't superlative in any of those particular areas. But I've often wondered what happened to those most likely to succeed people. And some time ago, I, I went back through some yearbooks and, and uh, looked at the names and faces. And I, I was surprised I didn't even remember 
most of those people. If you and I had been first century Jews, and we'd been asked to vote on the most likely to be saved, Nicodemus would have come to mind. Because this man, of all men, surely this man was a saved man. He was, verse 1, a Pharisee. He was, verse 1, a ruler of the Jews. Remember the Sanhedrin. And he was, verse 10, the teacher, definite article, the teacher of Israel. He was a man of prominence, influence. He was highly respected. So had you been asked to vote on the most likely man to be saved, I suspect Nicodemus would have won the vote. How could the teacher of Israel not be saved? When you hear the name Billy Graham, perhaps you think of uh, America's preacher, which he was, wasn't he, for uh, many years, many very fruitful years, and we fully expect, I think rightly so, to see Billy Graham in heaven. The first century Jew would have said, Nicodemus is a shoe-in. He is a slam dunk. But Jesus said in so many words, not so fast. Point number one, he was a dead man. Verse three. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, the Greek is amen, amen. Whenever you see that formulaic expression, you know something serious and solemn and important is about to come. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus went to Jesus at night, no doubt intentionally, under cover. He had an important... Uh, conversation in mind. He began the conversation with these very pious platitudes. Teacher, we know you must have come from God because of these wonderful signs you do. You've turned water to wine in Cana. You, you are a teacher from God, and I'm quite sure Nicodemus expected Jesus to, to reciprocate and say, well, Nicodemus, I've heard so much about you, man. I'm so glad to meet you. Your reputation precedes you. What an outstanding teacher from God you are. <laughs> but Jesus didn't do that. You got to be born again. Everybody has to be born again or they don't get in. Nicodemus was alive physically. He was walking and talking and teaching and living and loving and, and enjoying life, no doubt. But inside was a dead heart. How did Jesus know that? I don't know. <laughs> but I know that chapter 2 ended with the words that Jesus entrusted himself to no man because he knew what was in the heart of man. He knew what was in Nicodemus' heart. Chapter 3. In chapter 4, we'll see that he knew what was in a Samaritan's woman's heart. In chapter 5, we'll see that he, he, know, he knew what was in the heart of an invalid. In chapter 6, in the heart of his disciples. In chapter 7, the hearts of his brothers. Chapter 8, the, the hearts of some Jews that gave him a hard time. And Jesus looked into that heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And he looked into that heart, and he saw a dead heart that needed to be born again. Nicodemus looked the part and talked the part and had the resume and wasn't what we would call a bad person. He wasn't a thief. He wasn't a thug. He wasn't a murderer, adulterer, etc. He was what what we would call a good moral man. Never mind the fact Jesus said, nobody's good but God. But we don't always think the way he thinks, so we'd have put Nicodemus in the good man category. Jesus put him in the dead man category. A few of you know this story, so bear with me. 
as I repeat it, but when our youngest son was six or seven years old, he and I were watching The Fellowship of the Ring one night. And it was that dramatic scene, if you've seen it, in uh, the forest where the battle is raging and the good guys are fighting the bad guys and the swords are clashing and the arrows are flying. And Boromir, the valiant warrior with fair and noble face, was fighting away and he was a good guy and taking it out on the bad guys until all of a sudden and he's hit with an arrow and he's stunned of course but he gathers himself and with arrow protruding he continues to fight and continues to shoot arrows until now there's two of them <laughs> and he's really stunned and it's very dramatic but somehow he gathers himself and he, he, he keeps shooting more arrows and killing more of the enemy until three arrows and he drops to his knees <laughs> and he, he hangs tough but finally he died and my sweet little boy looked at me and said daddy do you think that hurt? <laughs> and I said, well, John, he died, didn't he? And John said, yeah, but Daddy, he barely died. <laughs> I said, John, what good is barely dead? <laughs> Travis said it earlier, dead, dead. He was, if it makes you feel better to think he barely died, go right ahead. <laughs> but dead is dead. And Nicodemus was dead. What difference does it make if somebody's barely dead or dead, dead? Good for Nicodemus that he was a Pharisee. Good for him that he was a ruler of the Jews. Good for him that he was the teacher of Israel. He needed to be born again. How? Logical question. And Nicodemus asked that very logical question in the next verse. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus is going to answer that question and absolutely blow his mind. Point one, he's a dead man. Point two, he was a helpless man. Verse eight, Jesus said, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And to be born of the Spirit is simply another expression, figure of speech for being born again. When we're born again, we're born of the Spirit. Now in verse 5, to answer Nicodemus' question, Jesus said, Amen, Amen, truly, truly, get this, this is important. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now the smart people, the people that would have won those superlative contests, of which I'm not one, the commentators and the scholars, aren't really sure what Jesus meant by water, being born of water. Maybe baptism, uh, maybe just the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit, or maybe the natural birth. The very next verse says, uh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So the context may favor the, the latter uh, viewpoint. But the point is, it doesn't really matter. In the grand scheme of things, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus is dying to know how. He's ready. I think he's willing. So he's saying, Jesus, how do I do it? And to answer that question and illustrate the point, Jesus suddenly became a weatherman. And he starts talking about the wind. It blows where it will. You, 
you uh, hear it, you, 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 may, you may see the trees moving, you, you feel it. So is everyone born of the, of the Spirit. It's like the wind. Question, do we control the wind? Can we control the wind? Do the trees control the wind? Do the trees move the wind or the wind move the trees? Which is it? No, we can't control it. We just see its effects. Second question, can we control the Spirit of God? No. We just see His effects. So here's the answer to Nicodemus' question, and it's a humbling answer. Two words, you can't. Nicodemus says, how can, I, how can I be born again, in essence? And Jesus says, you can't. Any more than you can control the wind that blows outside. It's the work of God, not the work of man, not the work of our own uh, energy or initiative or something. And this is why birth is the perfect metaphor to use. Because when we got born, you remember that? <laughs> when we got born, somebody else did all the work. We call her what? Mother. And when we get born of the Spirit or born again, somebody else does all the work. We call him Father. Or if you want to be more specific, Holy Spirit. Some people will say from time to time, and I think I've made this mistake, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be born again. But that's backwards. We can't believe. We're dead, dead, dead. We've got to be quickened. We've got to be enabled to believe. And that's why we sang that wonderful hymn by Charles Wesley a few moments ago. Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in nature's sin and night until thine eye diffused a quickening ray. Now the question is, what compelled him to do that? I didn't, you didn't, Nicodemus didn't. Just his mere free grace and love. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray, then what? I woke. By the way, apologies to my starting point class, because this is deja vu. They, they got all this this morning. Their heads are still spinning, I suspect. But he diffused the quickening ray. I woke. I came to life. God, Ephesians 2, made me alive again in Christ. I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart at last was free to believe. And I rose, I was dead, but I rose and I went forth and I followed thee. It's the work of God. Amen. Some people define preaching as the fine art of talking in another man's sleep. <laughs> Regrettably, that is true, sometimes, for some of you. <laughs> But theologically, it would be more precise to say preaching is the fine art of talking to dead, dry bones. And did you notice from Ezekiel, they were very dry. Dead, dead, dead. A long time. Not barely dead. Dead, dead, dead. And what brought them to life? Here's something very interesting. God says, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And I am very confident Ezekiel didn't know what to say. So he was a smart guy, and he just said, Thou knowest, Lord. <laughs> I don't have any idea. You know. And God says, start preaching. So imagine that. Preaching to dry bones. It's no wonder Paul calls it the foolishness of preaching. 
But faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And he preached, and next thing you know, there's a mighty army. It's a picture of what's happened to you and me. We were just dry bones, and we heard the word somewhere, the preacher, the Sunday school teacher, the parents. God used it to fuse that quickening ray. Now, there occasionally are people who will say, well, what if I want to be born again? But I'm afraid I'm not. I'm afraid I, I'll never be. And so I'll worry about that. Well, here's the answer to that question. What else do very dry bones worry about? That's a serious question. <laughs> bones don't worry. Dead, dead, dead doesn't worry. If you're worried about it, I can almost guarantee you've already been born again. God's already done some work of grace in your heart. You may be like the man in the Bible that said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. But at least you've got faith as a mustard seed. And God who begins a good work will always complete it. So stop the worrying about being born again. Nicodemus was a dead man and Nicodemus was a helpless man. And last, the teacher of Israel was an ignorant man. Verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Nicodemus envisioned himself, I'm sure, as a great theologian. But Jesus lectured him like he was a little schoolboy. The teacher of Israel had a lot to learn about the glory of sovereign grace. Nicodemus no doubt believed that, that um, every Jew would be saved because that was the common thinking. They were the chosen people. To be a Jew is to be saved. Unless there was some notable wickedness uh, and or apostasy. But otherwise to be saved, to be Jew rather was to be saved. And Nicodemus had to learn that was not the case, not even for a rabbi, not even for a Pharisee, not even for the teacher of Israel, not even for Gentiles, not even for anybody, unless there's a notable work of God to quicken these dead hearts, breathe life into us, and compel us to believe. So why are you a Christian as I said in my class this morning, it's not because we're any smarter than anybody else. God has just been gracious for reasons not within us. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Even if there's just faith like a little mustard seed. It's the work of God. I know many of you are familiar with uh, the Great Awakening, which happened uh, in this country in 1730s, 1740s, and maybe a little bit longer than that. started in England, spread over to the colonies, helped unify the colonies for at least a while, it was rooted in Calvinistic theology, uh, many lives were changed and many fine educational institutions were spawned out of it. Uh, Princeton and uh, Rutgers and Brown and Dartmouth and uh, perhaps uh, some others. One of the leaders of the Great Awakening was a man named George Whitfield. Also uh, Jonathan Edwards and... Um, uh, Charles and John Wesley. But Whitfield was once asked, uh, to what did he attribute the Great Awakening, humanly speaking? And Whitfield credited it to one sermon he preached. And he didn't mean this in, a, in an arrogant way, but it was one sermon he felt like God used. Over, and he preached it over and over again. The title was, 
the nature and necessity of the new birth in Christ. As a teenager, George Whitfield was very, very rebellious. And uh, somewhere as he moved out of adolescence into adulthood, he decided he'd fix himself. You ever decided to fix yourself? <laughs> so he, uh, he tried to fix himself by punishing himself, practicing self-denial. He ate foods he didn't like. He gave his money to the poor. He spent whole nights in prayer or something approaching prayer, prostrate on cold stones or wet grass. <laughs> But later he admitted it didn't change his heart a bit. And it was just like painting over rotten wood. And then a friend by the name of Charles Wesley gave him a book. And Whitfield was never the same. God preached to him through the book. And Whitfield later said, After having undergone innumerable buffetings by day and night, God was pleased at length to remove my heavy load and to enable me by living faith to lay hold on his dear son. And oh, with what joy, joy unspeakable and full of glory was I filled with when the weight of sin left me and an abiding sense of the pardoning love of God broke in upon my disconsolate soul. And the first thing he did was to write his relatives and say to them, I have found that there is such a thing as the new birth. Nicodemus is every man, every woman, every person. We're all by nature dead, helpless, and ignorant. So you may say, okay, preacher, what can we do? <laughs> What's the practical application? What can we do? I'll tell you what we can do. We repent of our sins, and we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we do that, we will know that we have done that only because God has first worked in our hearts and done a little surgery, as Ezekiel says elsewhere, and taken away the heart of stone and given us a heart of flesh, a new heart, a new birth. And there'll never be any room for spiritual pride or boasting. Father, <clears throat> we bow before you to acknowledge that we would never be here apart from your power and your love and your grace that's been poured out upon us poor, undeserving, miserable sinners. We know not why, we only see the effects of what you have done for us. So please accept our gratitude and thanksgiving. Forgive us for the times we have been prideful and grieved your spirit, conducted ourselves in ways that are displeasing to you. And grant, Lord, uh, that you would impress upon our hearts and minds daily how dead we were and how far away we were and how without hope we were until you graciously arrested us and diffused that quickening ray. Complete what you have started in us, Father, and sanctify our hearts and conform us more and more to the image of Christ, your Son, our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen.